I want to begin tonight by talking a little bit about how I personally enter this work of contemplative education, which is a, a passion of mine, as Tobin was, uh, was expressing. And another passion of mine is diversity and, and social justice issues. And I'm very interested to see how contemplative education plays a part in social justice and, and diversity. I enter this work as a Latina, as a Mexican-American woman who grew up in Texas along the US Mexico border, who grew up in poverty, and who now occupies a privileged space in American higher education. I, one of my biggest passions is to help students who grow up like me, having hopes and dreams, but not knowing exactly how to realize them. And so I view all of this work as connected, and it's my privilege to share my thoughts with you because I believe that we need what in my culture is called una persona educada. That the image of education that we have should result in a very wise individual. A person who possesses the habits, habits of the mind and heart. A person that can embrace reason thinking as well as emotional intelligence and diverse ways of knowing. These are the individuals that can be the decision makers of the future. We've had so many things happening in our world, things that I would never fathom that had happened in the world. And it makes me think about the decision makers that are going to be in charge of leading this country, of making decisions about what to do in a hurricane, of making decisions about what to do in a tsunami or when a virus breaks out or things that we can't even imagine. So we need to be also concerned about the coming generation of students and how we're going to work with them. We saw in this recent election the whole notion that the election made a difference because of changing demographics. And the changing demographics are in our schools right now. If you go to the schools in LA and in Houston, in New York, in Cleveland, in Miami, in Seattle, and you see the future of this country. So as educators, whether we're in K-12 or in higher ed, we need to be concerned about this generation of students who, quite frankly, we don't know how to work with very well who quite frankly, we haven't been prepared to work with this new demographics. Politics is not prepared for that. This was a shocker that happened a week ago. And we just have not been prepared, but you know what? It's a coming, it's right there actually. And we need to know how to work with these students. So one of the things that I did to prepare my thinking as I thought about contemplative education is to read and read and read so that I could embrace and really you know, become very thoughtful about what I was going to do because I didn't want my thinking to come out as something that really I hadn't done any work on. I think it's very important that we're going to be contemplative educators, that we have to do the deep work of having a personal contemplative practice of our own and having done the deep work of reading and getting to know the literature and of understanding diverse ideas. And one of the most important books that I read about transformation, believe it or not, was this little book, many of you have probably seen it, it's called The Four Agreements, Los Cuatro Acuerdos, by Don Miguel Ruiz, who is a Toltec. And this elder says that if we can see it is our agreements which rule our life, and we don't like the dream of life, we need to change the agreements. I have to tell you that when I first read that, I really didn't understand it because he's talking in his own way of knowing, in a very spiritual, indigenous way, so to speak. And so as I thought about it more, I said, ah, basically what he's saying is that the dream of life is like the vision. I mean, like institutions of higher education always have their mission and vision. Schools have their mission and vision. And what he's saying is we don't like that mission and vision. 
If we don't like the rules and the policies that govern that mission and vision, we need to change them. We need to create a new mission. We need to create a new dream of life. And he talks about what he believes are some of the most important things that we need to do as human beings, to be authentic, to say what we mean, not to take anything personally, don't make assumptions, always do your best. And recently he added a fifth agreement to be skeptical and to listen with your heart. Some of that is very similar to what Angelus Arian is proposing. So I want to take this framework of these internal agreements, as Linda called them, this framework of what we agree to in terms of our own life and, and in our professional life and in our personal life, I mean, you know, I had a teacher who told me I would never be a teacher, you know, and had I made that agreement with her, you know, and for a while I was sort of sad about that because I thought, well, maybe I can't be. So I'm agreeing with her, right? You know, but I shook free from that. And here I am, you know, giving public talks and being a professor. So obviously I broke that agreement with her. So we need to expose and shatter the subtractive agreements, the belief system that works against students. So let me share some of these agreements with you. One of them, and Tobin brought this up, is that test scores are the only thing that matter. Okay? Somehow our schools have bought into this notion about testing, testing, testing. Well, why do we come up with this whole notion that, hey, you know, our children are more than a test score. They're whole human beings. And so we need to work with our students in a way that actually helps them to learn in a broad way, in a way, too, that we can identify, I see you. I see you as a student. I, you may be different than I am, but I see you. And I'm willing to take the time to learn more about you and your culture to do a better job. And I'm willing to deepen the teaching and learning experience by infusing contemplative education to help you to really develop yourself as a person and to help me to do a better job in working with you. So a new agreement would be that, you know, hey, our schools are not testing centers, as Linda Landeri has said. Our schools are teaching and learning organizations. And they ought to be concerned with a broad education, not just about test scores. Another subtractive agreement is that students should tough it out and learn to succeed without any help. You know, every time that I, I talk to, to teachers, they say, well, you know, it's these students, they don't care, you know, they're not motivated, and I'm not going to do anything. If they don't want to show up, they can, you know, whatever and they ought to tough it out. I did it, why can't they, okay? But they don't understand that a lot of low-income children can benefit from an ethic of care and support. I give you the work of Angela Valenzuela from UT Austin who wrote a book called Subtractive Schooling. I give you the work of Nell Noddings who has written about the ethic of care. And essentially, I've come to believe that with some care at the beginning, and authentic caring, not something, oh, okay, I'm going to try this. No, it has to come from within us. We're reaching out to these students that we can let them know we believe in them, that we care about them, that we're partners in teaching and learning with them, and that this sort of validation, that this sort of confirmation can make a big difference for students that don't even know what questions to ask, for students who come from broken homes, for students who have been told that they'll, they'll never make it. So that's the kind of care that we need to provide. There is also a belief system about teaching and learning. And one of them I call the agreement of monoculturalism. And that perpetuates itself through the exclusive validation of Western structures of knowledge. This focus on individual achievement as opposed to collective achievement, this focus on rationality, and the subjugation of knowledge created by women, indigenous people, and people of color. It's, a, it's a, as if that knowledge and that way of knowing is not valid enough. 
it also manifests itself in course offerings which preserve the superiority of Western civilization and the dominance of faculty and administrators who subscribe to monocultural paradigms. But there are other ways of knowing that are also important. And these that I have here are really some that are marginalized, they're trivialized, um, they're viewed in some ways as touchy-feely and kumbaya kind of stuff. But there are important, we know the power of personal experience. The perspectives and styles of women, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, as well as the views of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, they too have knowledge and ways of being. Dreams and meditational states that unite the self with a higher and deeper wisdom. And indigenous communities really work with you know, ritual and ceremony and dream work. And, and so, Gregory Cajete, I was impressed with his book because he points out that there is no word for education in most indigenous languages. Rather, education is best described as coming to know. It's not that I know it, but I come to know things, which entails a journey, a process, a quest for understanding and knowledge. So we need to change this agreement that Western ways of knowing should be privileged above all other forms of knowledge. It's not that I want to toss out Western perspectives. What I'm saying is that there's more than one way. There's the West, there's the East, there's the South, there's the North. And all of those have ways of knowing that we need to consider. So a new agreement is the agreement of multiculturalism and respect for diverse ways of acquiring wisdom and knowledge. Then there's the agreement to privilege intellectual, rational knowing that privileges cerebral abilities. It's all about the brain and the science of the brain, and that's all good and well. It, but, you know, we're privileging and rewarding outer knowing at the expense of inner knowing. We really don't pay attention to things like helping our students develop wisdom, a sense of wonder, of working with social and emotional learning. And we do this even when we have research that shows that there are more than one or two intelligences. There is more than one way to know. I give you Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, where he talks about how success and college achievement depend on all intelligences, and yet we focus primarily on the first two, on linguistic and logical, mathematical forms of intelligence. I give you the work of Daniel Goldman, who identified emotional intelligence and its connection to neural systems in the brain. And he says that EQ is probably more important than IQ for job performance and leadership. And here are the five elements of EQ. I know Linda has done great work with uh, Daniel Goldman on emotional uh, learning and em emotional intelligence. So we need to reframe the agreement that everything depends only on linguistic and logical mathematical abilities. But we need a new agreement, and that might be the agreement to work with diverse ways of knowing in the classroom. Because you see, it's not just about the mind. It's not just about the mind, as important as it is. I want our students to be good problem solvers and critical thinkers and analysts and writers. No question about that. But I also want them to be good human beings. I want them to be team players. I want them to understand themselves. I want them to have wisdom. I want them to you know, have good judgment. And so while academic content counts, so does personal experience. Western ways of knowledge count, but so does the knowledge contributed by women, people of color, indigenous, and non-Western scholars. Problem solving and critical thinking count, but so does developing a sense of purpose in life, becoming social activists, and becoming caring, compassionate humanitarians. So this brings me then, how do we transform our classroom? What do we do to help students to work 
harmonically and in balance with both their intellectual capacities and with their inner lives? How do we do that? How do we get them to engage more deeply in what they're learning? And how do we work with culturally diverse students and their ways of engaging the world? So let's talk about the classroom as a contemplative space. We just heard about contemplative practices. And one of the definitions of contemplative practices is from the Center for Contemplative Mind in Society. And basically, they say that these are practices that quiet the mind in order to cultivate a personal capacity for deep concentration and insight. And so they have a number of examples from meditation to community service, learning, et cetera. And, and here's, here's the, um, the, 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 the tree again. And you'll see that there are many different ways of employing contemplative practice from meditation, visualization, journaling, uh, pilgrimages to areas where social justice issues are highlighted, et cetera. It's a pretty good tree because it gives us a sense of how diverse contemplative practices can be. And some of them require you know, quiet time, but others require movement, others require music, et cetera. Uh, so um, I invite you to visit the, their website. So this brought me to thinking, though, what does contemplative engagement mean for students who grow up like me? You know, for students who have been oppressed, victimized, and marginalized, what does contemplative engagement mean for them? For those that do not have a stable home environment, who are invalidated, who are told you're never going to amount to anything. For students who have been treated as the other, what does contemplative engagement mean for them? In my experience, I have found that students value teaching and learning experiences where not only where they can find a deeper meaning in what they're learning, but where they can gain insight, where they can release the pain of their lives, where they can find voice, where they can heal, where they can come to terms with anger and the shadows of their life, where they can connect with others and form relationships, where they can express love, joy, and compassion, where they develop resiliency, and where they work with culturally relevant practices. I want to give you some examples of, of those things. Um, I gave a talk at Knox College last month, um, and um, I had an opportunity to sit down with students, and we were watching a very, very good documentary that I would recommend. It's called Louder Than a Bomb. How many of you have seen that? OK, so you'll know how powerful that is. It was featured on Oprah Winfrey's uh, network. And basically, I was impressed because it's the lar world's largest youth poetry slam held in Chicago. Okay, And I was impressed because the students participating in this poetry slam were pretty much inner city kids. Uh, they're kids that oftentimes we give up on. They're kids that people think, mm, they're not going to amount to anything. And yet, I saw that documentary, and I saw students doing contemplative work through poetry. And through that poetry, expressing their lives in a raw way, expressing their anger, expressing their fears, expressing their frustrations, but yet coming out of all of that as a healed individual, yet coming out of all of that having learned to write and to express themselves and to become articulate. These are students who find voice, but who find themselves as a learner, as someone that can actually participate fully in the educational system that we have. So I want to give you an example of a clip from that um, documentary, Louder Than a Bomb. And this is by a student called Nova. Her name is Nova uh, Venerable. 
And Nova's father uh, was an addict. Her younger brother suffered from diabetes. And basically, she was in charge of taking care of her father, uh, even when she was a little girl, to the point that she would iron for him and cook for him and even make mixed drinks for him, alcoholic beverages for him. And so Nova talks, and I want to show you this video. My father grew up in a neighborhood where he got it bad from both sides, black people, white people, just because he was mixed. And as a result, because he grew up fighting, he grew up aggressive. And as a father, he was aggressive. When my parents got divorced, we thought that we didn't have to see him anymore. It turned out that we had to go there four out of seven days of the week. There are always sirens outside your place. Your condo always seemed to lean to the left. The cement windows rusted like overused water pipes. We lived on the first floor. What she writes about is hardcore, raw stuff. And when she says it, she gets in that place. So when she's on stage, you're, you're there with her. Our condo door was tainted white, like a three-year-old sock washed every week. The walls were the 49ers, and the carpet was rough like tangled hair. Everything you had no room for piled onto shelf like children. I fell into the caregiver role. I took care of him. I braided his hair before he went to work. I ironed his clothes. I woke him up before he went to work. You would always ask me to make your drinks. Measure liquid with the width of my nine-year-old fingers, four fingers sangria, two gin, two tonic, and one lemon juice. Well, I grew older, and I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I left. By the time I was 10, I was your wife, your sister, your mother, your best friend, and you were bitter. I would feed you chicken soup when you were sick, kiss your forehead to see how bad your fever was. But I'm 17 now and we don't even talk. And sometimes I wish I could tell you how much I miss you, how I want to wrap my arms around your sunken stomach like tissue paper, that I love you. Wish that you were here to be my Papa G again, so you would know that I have a boyfriend that loves me more than you ever used to. But I guess you're too busy rusting like cement windows to notice that your baby girl is a woman and how my memory will fade like your four-finger sangria, two gin, two tonic, and one lemon juice. My father and I haven't spoken since I was 12. And I feel like I've been trying so hard to just get rid of his memory. I just don't want to think about it anymore. So I wanted to give you some examples. Um, I'm just going to pick. Uh, you know, one or two examples here, because um, I'm running out of time. But here's an example of, of a professor in, in ethnic, ethnic studies. Uh, but it could be in, in sociology or psychology. And as I told you, I'm interested in social justice issues. And, and so the social justice issue here would be, for example, illuminating cultural events relevant to people of color assisting students to find a deeper sense of meaning, purpose, and identity, and self-worth. And you could stop at just intellectual engagement, which would be research and interviews. But at a deeper level, you could do arts-based reflective assignments. And I'm particularly impressed with this professor that I spoke to and his use of what he calls cajitas, sacred boxes that students construct to reflect their lives. Um, so this box here was done by um, a student named Valerie Parra, and um, the title you can see on the top sheet, I, I usually ask students to write like a narrative, which the students here today did a great job in, and it's called My Life as a Mestiza, Valerie Parra, and um, the little that I know about it, the, the, the discussions that we had about it, was that, um, was that she is part, she considers herself part Chicana and part Apache, and so when you look at the imagery in terms of the symbols, you see some of the traditional symbols that you would see in terms of being Mexicana or Chicana and, and that whole process. But then you see some of the Native American influence. And she does, she did all these kind of different symbols around here. You can see, you know, Christian symbols and Native American symbols. Um, up on top, which you can't get access to, there's an actual um, field 
of, 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 a, of, a, of a agricultural field. There's an eagle that's been carved in. There's a horse. There's some Native American symbols as well. And um, I think it just captures what, what the students were talking about in terms of those dualities. Here are some of the cajitas that students have put together in my classes. This the student, her cajita is that wrap. It's called a lapas, and she's honoring her grandmother who wore it in Liberia because in the, the war during the 90s, they had to be ready to leave at any time, and they would wrap all their belongings in this lapas. In the area of history, the social justice issue could be the civil rights movement, the oppression of people of color, and of course, the intellectual engagement research. Contemplative engagement could be reflecting on photos, films, and music that capture the experiences of oppressed people. And a phenomenal person that does this is Herman Blake. I use in the class some of my own material, my own research, I have them listen to, for example, when I talk about slavery, I have them listen to an interview done in 1968 with a woman whose mother was a breeder. And it was her mother's job to have babies. And this woman talks. She was the 15th child of this woman, born just after peace declared, as she put it. She was, I think, 94 or 98 or something like this. And I have a picture of her, which I show along with the transcript. I want to tell you, you can't hear that and walk away without thinking. When I get to talking about terrorism and violence, I use about six or seven slides from that book without sanctuary. And I raise two questions. Why do they lynch people? And then I show the pictures of the crowds who came to enjoy the spectacle, including young children. And one student wrote an essay saying this course is not only about learning, this course is about thinking. And you think all the time. I use music because the music was used by the people to illustrate these points. So when they hear this woman, whose mother was a breeder, I play for them the spiritual, Lord, how come me here? I wish I never was born. When they see those slides about how people have been misused and mistreated, I had them listen to Nina Simone singing Strange Fruit. I just gave a lecture on the civil rights movement, and at the beginning of the 20th century, I had them listen to the spiritual, Lord, I couldn't hear nobody pray, talking. To, I want to um, end by indicating that what I feel we need in the world today to get to that persona educada is a holistic pedagogy. It's a pedagogy that is in my view, from you know, the way that I developed it, that I call senti pensante pedagogy, it's rooted in ancient wisdom. I'm not creating this you know, because this has been around for generations. We haven't paid attention to it. But one that honors diverse ways of knowing, that views individuals as whole human beings, and that promotes the acquisition of both knowledge and wisdom. And basically, this is about what Galliano calls the celebration, the celebration of heart and mind. He writes, why does one write if not to put one's pieces together? From the moment that we enter school or church, education chops us into pieces. It teaches us to divorce soul from body and mind from heart. The fishermen of the Colombian coast must be learned doctors of ethics and morality, for they invented the word senti pensante, senti pensante, sensing, feeling. To define a language, 
that speaks the truth. So if you are here tonight, then you are. You are Santi Pensantes along with me. Thank you for allowing, allowing me to share my work and best wishes as you construct this new dream of education for the diverse student body in American higher education. Muchísimas gracias.